Good morning. Our opening song will be hymn number 287, Softly and Tenderly. song will be hymn number 195, Showers of Blessings.
72. Morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Um, we'll start off with a word of prayer. Please bow your heads. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for a beautiful Sabbath. We ask that you'll send your presence to here to be with us, that we can have your thoughts in our heart, and you'll guide the study today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So um, I'm going to tell you a true story. It's about it, it's called um, Four Guys Riding in a Car. That's the title of this talk here. Um, so there were four guys riding in a car, an atheist, a Catholic, a Mormon, and an Adventist. The conversation went to the topic of the stars and the speed of light and how old the earth was. And the atheist said, according to evolution, the world is billions of years old. And the Adventist said, evolution was just a theory, and he believed the world was only a few thousand years old. The atheist became incensed and said sharply that evolution was no longer a theory, but a proven fact. The Mormon smiled and said something about Adam and the third heaven. Uh, but the Catholic said, God must have used evolution in the creation process. So the last time I gave uh, the Sabbath School Superintendent notes, um, I showed how to do a word study with um, Bible um, software called Logos. And it, it, uh, the software is free, but it's more than just the Bible software. It serves as a personal digital library. And Faith Life, the company that makes the software, sells books um, that you can add to your personal library. And I have purchased a few Bible versions, the Andrews Study Notes and the E.G. White Collection. Every year on my birthday, they give me some money to spend on their online bookstore. 
And they also give away a free book every month. I usually add them to my library, but I don't, I usually don't get very far before I start losing interest in those books. Um, but back to the story. Um, it's amazing to me that Satan has done such a good job at deceiving the world regarding origins. If you stop and analyze what it would take for the world as we know it to evolve, it is simply unbelievable. And yet, even Christians are going along with this theory. One of the free books of the month was a, uh, about what the Catholic Church teaches regarding creation and evolution. And it, um, it's called, In the Beginning, A Catholic Understanding of the Story of Creation and the Fall by Boniface Ramsey, also known as Pope Benedict XVI, and it was published in 1995. And so, while developing this topic t today, um, I didn't read the whole book, but I looked at certain sections of it, and uh, I'm going to be quoting from, or showing you basically what the Catholics teach regarding this. Uh, so here are some facts about the Catholics. Uh, they're, according to Google and Wikipedia, they make up the largest percentage of Christians, over 50 percent, and over they have over 1.3 billion members. So what does the largest branch of Christianity teach about origins? Sadly, like uh, the, the person in the story, um, they teach that evolution must be true. And according to this book, that it didn't happen by chance so much as God directing the rolls of the die. It's kind of what I understood from what he was trying to say. So regarding the creation account in Genesis, Pope Benedict XVI, in his 100-page book, he waxes eloquently with philosophy that attempts to explain away the Bible while asserting that God is an all-powerful being, but not daring to contradict popular science. Writing about Genesis 1 and 2, he says, yet these words give rise to a certain conflict. They are beautiful and familiar, but are they also true? It reminds me of the, the servant asking Eve, is that what God said? Everything seems to speak against it, for science has long since disposed of the concepts that we have just now heard. The idea of a world that is completely comprehensible in terms of space and time, and the idea that creation was built up piece by piece over the course of seven days. So it seems like he kind of wants to believe what the Bible says, literally, but he can't do that because it, it, um, popular science, I guess. Um, further on, he essentially says that the creation story was given to draw attention to the true God and to make people to stop caring about gods and demons. Then he says things like this. This is the living God, and this same power which created the earth and the stars and which bears the whole universe is the very one whom we meet in the word of the Holy Scripture. In this word, we come into contact with the real primor primordial force of the world and the power that is above all powers. So he's got that word primordial in there, which is... Uh, what is it? Evolution teaches that the cells came from the primordial soup. For some reason, the author compares the faith of an atheist to that of a Christian. I thought this section was interesting. So he talks about Jacques Monod, and, and it says, he, who rejects as unscientific every kind of faith in God, who thinks that the world originated out of an interplay of chance and necessity, tells in the very work in which he attempts to summar summarily to portray and justify his view of the world that after attending the lectures in which afterward appeared in book form, Francius Marique um, is supposed to have said, what 
this professor wants to inflict on us is far more unbelievable than what we poor Christians were ever expected to believe. So he's kind of doesn't like the idea, or he's kind of poking fun, I think, at um, the, what the atheists believe. Monod does not dispute this. His thesis is that the entire ensemble of nature has arisen out of errors and dissonances. He cannot help but say himself that such a conception is in fact absurd. So even the atheist is saying that this is sort of absurd. But according to him, the scientific method demands that a question not be permitted to which the answer would have to be God. That's what popular science is all about. They will not allow there to be a God in any evidence or explanation. One can only say that a method of this sort is pathetic. God himself shines through the reasonableness of his creation. So this is the closer, closest that the author goes to disagree with evolution in the whole book. Um, and then the author attributes some of the wonders of, natural, of the natural world to the creative intelligence of God. He says, physics and biology and the natural sciences in general have given us a new and unheard of creation account with vast new images, which let us recognize the face of the creator and which make us realize once again that the very beginning and foundation of all being, there is a creating intelligence. The universe is not the product of darkness and unreason. It comes from intelligence, freedom, and from the beauty that is identical with love. Seeing that, seeing that, seeing this gives us the courage to keep living. It empowers us, comforted thereby, to take upon ourselves the adventure of life. So he's acknowledging the powerful God that creates the, the you know the universe but he won't go so far as to make God powerful enough to create the world in seven days. Oh, he goes very close, and he even notes the relationship between creation and the Ten Commandments, and specifically the commandment regarding the Sabbath rest. The words God said appeared ten times in the creation account. In this way, the creation narrative anticipates the Ten Commandments. This makes us realize that these Ten Commandments are, as it were, an echo of the creation. kind of don't see what he's saying there, but anyway. And then he says, the number that governs the whole is seven. In the scheme of seven days, it permeates the whole in a way that cannot be overlooked. This is the number of the phase of a phase of the moon, and thus we are told throughout this account that the rhythm of our heavenly neighbor also sounds the rhythm of our human life. So according to him, the seven-day week is not based on the days of creation. It's based on the rhythm of life, the number of a phase of the moon, whatever that means. I don't know. And here are some other quotes. The rhythm is itself at the service of a still deeper meaning. Creation is oriented to the Sabbath, which is the sign of the covenant between God and humankind. That's true. We can draw this conclusion. Creation is designed in such a way that it is oriented to worship the universe. Uh, that is or oriented to worship. The universe exists for worship for, and for the glorification of God. The Bible declares that creation has its structure in the Sabbath ordinance. In, creation, in the creation account, the Sabbath is depicted as the day when, human being, when the human being in the freedom of worship participates in God's freedom, in God's rest, and thus in peace, God's peace, to celebrate the Sabbath means to celebrate the covenant. So according to the author, the seven days of cre creation are important for worship on one day of the week, the Sab a Sabbath day, but not the actual literal seven days of the creation week. The author men mentions the year of Jubilee, where every 50 years there's a great reset. He says that we have been caught up in the slavery of activity, and God had to give us the Sabbath that we denied ourselves. In their no to the God-given rhythm of freedom and leisure, they departed from their likeness to God, and so did damage to the earth. So the Catholics, they want to bring back the Sabbath. 
but they want it to be on uh, with their form of worship on the day that they choose in defiance to God's explicit commandment. And they say that because man has strayed from the weekly rhythm of rest, the earth has been damaged. So uh, they're going along with the global warming climate change agenda, or that's going to fit in with um, we know by what Bible prophecy says about uh, what's coming very soon. They want to praise God for his creation and yet deny him the power to do it in seven days. How can we praise God for taking eons of time with countless deaths of his supposed creation, which seemingly by chance created the marvelous natural world that we live in? I mean, that just that doesn't go with the character that's expressed in the Bible at all. Now, what a confusing dilemma we face when we try to embrace two opposing worldviews. I could see the author's struggle in, the, in this book to give credence to the words of the Bible and yet not ruffle any feathers in regards to popular science. And that is what the Catholic Church does. They follow the ways of the serpent, mixing error with truth, and it results in, what's the word, another word for Babylon? Confusion. And their Christians are taught to just listen to what the priest says, not to worry about what the Bible says, because it's too difficult to understand. So I thank the Lord that his word is true, and that we can take the Bible as it reads, without having to rationalize away its meaning. I thank him for his spirit that gives us understanding, and that there are scientific explanations for so-called evidence of evolution in popular science. We serve a wonderful and all-powerful, kind and loving God who created a system of life with no death, something that we cannot understand now, but we will in the new heaven and the new earth. Come, Lord Jesus, soon. Amen. Uh, it's now time to separate for our Sabbath school classes. Um, there's a young adult youth class in the fellowship hall. There's a small, steady, a small group study in um, the office here. And the main adult study is here in the sanctuary. One today? That's very good. We want to uh, start with a word of prayer just to ask for God's presence, for Him to guide us, direct our conversation, our responses that we can be honoring to Him. So let's just bow our prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, this morning we come realizing our need of You and that You are the answer. You are the one that can direct our minds, and Father, as we study your mission and, and your plan for our lives, we just ask that you will direct our conversation, and this we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Also, I want to be uh, praying for Tom, since he was going to be doing the lesson this morning, but is ending up not feeling well. So I want that he can be uh, restored to quick health and strength. So we're starting a, a new quarter. I don't know whether you have your quarterly yet, but it's on God's mission and my mission. And this morning, we're going to start by looking at the heart of our Heavenly Father. And we're going to be reading a number of passages from the Bible. They're probably things that you're familiar with, and you might think, why do we need to read these? But I'm fully convinced that when we read the Word, that there is power in it, and God can work through that. So we're going to start by going to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, and going to be reading Genesis 1, verses 26 and 
to 28. So 26, 27, and 28. And uh, let's see. Um, Les, could you read that? Do we have a microphone that we could bring? Could you ring verses 26, 27, and 28 of Genesis chapter 1? Up here, Doug. Oh, we got just the microphone. That way those online can be able to hear. Um, so before Les reads this, the, the, the question I want you to be answering afterwards is, what was God's original ideal for the human family? So what was God's ideal for the human family? Les. Genesis 1, 26 through 28, and I read, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fruit of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Thank you very much. So, as you listen to those verses, what was God's original ideal for God's, for the human family? What, what was he envisioning? How were things going to work? Okay. What I get out of it is uh, when God is speaking, he's doing things in a co coordinated effort. Okay. Including us. You know, and, and when he said, let us, I think that's the Godhead that this, he's talking about there. But uh, man is obviously in, involved in it, so it's a coordinated effort. Okay, so coordinated effort, God putting into plan. What, what else? Anyone else? What, what do you think God's plan for the human family was? Less. God said, let us make man in our image. So our indicates there's more than one God. Okay. He said, let us make them. So apparently it takes more than male or female to be in the image of God. In my mind, it takes a man and a woman both to be in the image of God. Okay. So it takes two in the image of God, and what's, what's the relationship between in the Godhead? You can go to Brittany. I was just going to comment, there's the word replenish in there. Okay. And that's an interesting point, we're replenishing the earth, well, replenishing it from what? Well, what just happened, we had the fall in heaven with the angels that were cast out, mm -hmm. we're replenishing that we're, we're fixing um, with God. Um, and Ellen White states that in manuscript 78, 19, um, 1901. She said, Infinite love, how great it is. God made the world to enlarge heaven. He desires a larger family of created intelligences. Beautiful. And he gives us that creative, creative uh, power. And his ideal or goal was, was there to be conflict. No, there wasn't meant to be conflict. It was going to be union, just the way the Godhead functions, they work together. So that, that's the basis of how God intended it. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 3. And we want to read the first five verses of Genesis chapter 3. This is picturing what, what transpires after he has this, this plan, Jeff. Can you do that for me? Genesis 3, 1 to 5. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he made, said unto the woman, Ye hath God said, Yea, shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, 
But the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Thank you. So if we, in, in Revelation 12, 7, where it says, And war broke out in heaven, Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. And it tells us, you know, the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan. So we have God's plan of what the earth was meant to be like, and we have Satan here identified who came to disrupt God's plan. Now, we're all very familiar with this. Let's, I just want to read now a couple other verses in Genesis 3, verses 8 and 9. Let's see who could, Joe, could you read that for us? Genesis 3, verses 8 and 9. Genesis 3, verses 8 and 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam. Oh, sorry. On, start eight. And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of day. And Adam, his wife, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees in, of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Okay, so we are familiar with the story in Eden where Satan appears as that serpent in the tree and Eve separates from Adam. She comes, she's deceived, she eats the fruit and then gives it to Adam and he eats of it. And now where Joe just read, we find them in the garden. They hear God walking and what do they do? They hide. So... Does the heart of God change when you do something wrong? Okay, and no. Okay, he says our hearts change. So how did God react after their act of disobedience? What does he do? What, what is his Barbara? He's looking for them. Okay, he's, he's looking for them. them. What was the last thing you said? He's calling. He's, he's calling, calling for them. them. Okay. Anyone else want to add to that picture? Lynn. Yeah, <clears throat> we've all heard this, and, and I found it interesting. He's asking where they are. He knows where they are. It's, it's not a question <laughs> for him. But I like how the lesson pointed out. He brought it, it, they pointed out it was like a relational type thing. Um, like, where are you in regards to me and this whole situation mm -hmm. and your heart? And so it was a loaded question. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I like that because there's no aggression there. Okay. It's just he's asking, and he does the same thing for us. We can get ourselves twisted and off track. And he has the same question for us. Okay, so where are you? How are we doing? What's going on? And he wants us to have that clarity in our hearts of where we are. And, um, yeah, I just, anyway. Anybody else want to add to that? So we know Satan lied to, that, lied to, them, so, to Eve, right? And so they fall, and God is coming. He's asking, calling for them. So what, what does that reaction of God teach you or show you about his character? Sheila. Well, he's pursuing us, obviously, right? And he is presenting an opportunity okay. for us to get, come back into relationship with him. Okay. 
So he's pursuing, presenting an opportunity. Okay, we have a comment over here. Good morning, guys. I find it a little bit ironic in, in the, uh, the, the conversation that began between Eve and uh, Satan. And uh, in verse 5, it uh, ends in verse 5 with uh, talking about knowing good and evil. That would be a red flag right there. <laughs> that one thing by itself. This is the first mention uh, that I see of evil uh, to Adam and Eve. I'm sure there was conversations with God and Adam and Eve about this whole situation, but that, to me, would just raise a flag right there. Why in the world would anybody in a perfect state want to know anything about evil? Because if you face the, the master deceiver, we, we have a lot of knowledge today. Can we still be deceived? <laughs> if we, we need to stay, stay strong yet less. So I got a question. I'm the one that asked the questions. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Well, let's make it a statement then. <laughs> Is that more fair, brother? I, I'm good with questions. Okay, you know, we always talk about Adam and Eve, and they shouldn't have fell. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't have done it. We wouldn't be where we are today if it hadn't have been for our first parents. How often do we ask ourselves, have I fallen? I'd like to read something from this pen of inspiration, if I might. And this comes, let me see if I can. This comes from, I got the date, but I don't have the place it came from. I don't know why. Anyway, it comes from Ellen White. If the race had ceased to fall when Adam was driven from Eden, we should now be in a far more elevated condition physically, mentally, and morally. Now, I'm going to slide down through that paragraph, and I'm going to continue. But there has been a succession of falls. Men will not take warning from Adam's experience. They will indulge appetite and passion in direct violation of the law of God, and at the same time continue to mourn Adam's transgression which brought sin into the world. So before we go pointing our fingers, brother, and I'm not pointing my finger, brother, but before Les goes pointing his finger at what Adam and Eve did, Les needs to get on his knees and say, Lord, show me. Show me what I've done wrong. Forgive me. And I plead my sin before his throne of grace. God is in the business of, of reconciliation, and that's where we see him. His heart is a heart of love, and he is chasing after. He's coming towards them. A thought just came to me about, you know, this conversation uh, that we're talking about Adam and Eve, and uh, the difference between Adam and Eve at that time and us today is we have the propensity already to sin. At that point, they did not. That's where we kind of scratch our heads and we, we wonder why, why Satan went the direction he did in the first place. And I, I do the same thing with Adam and Eve. I wonder why they went the same uh, direction that they did for the same reason, because they didn't have at that point the propensity to sin. And apparently they had a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God, a face-to-face -face relationship. And so I scratch my head on that one. Well, to me, it just speaks of the, the, the uh, if, if you separate yourself from God, the, none of us, are, whatever, you know, they, were, they were no match for Satan if they separated themselves from God. So God's coming. Okay, yes. You know, when God created the earth, he had the whole universe in mind. Mm -hmm. He wanted to reveal himself to the entire universe. It's something we can't really comprehend. But to me, when he came searching for them, 
he already knew what had happened. He already had, mm -hmm. you know, they were created in his image. He loved them so Absolutely. much. He wanted to spend time with them. And I'm sure his heart was broken because now he knew what the future would be for the next, you know, 6,000 years. And so, you know, it's a huge picture if we really contemplate the friendship that he wanted to have, the um, relationship he wanted to have. He was their creator, but he was also their redeemer. And that plan was already in place. And they, of course, knew nothing about that. Mm -hmm. But I just think it shows a real beautiful side of God, the kind of God that we serve, that he'll always come searching for us. He'll always have a plan way in advance for our lives. And he'll always um, do it within the context that he wants to reveal himself, not just to us, but to the entire mm -hmm. universe yeah. in the big picture. Yes, absolutely. That is, and then Lynn. <coughs> well, bouncing off of that, it brings to mind the verse for the joy set before him. He endured the cross. Well, the joy, what was the joy? The future with us. And the joy in his heart of knowing what we will be. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's, that's awesome to realize. He looks at us and he sees us as we can be through his grace and the ministry of his Holy Spirit and angels. And then he looks with joy toward eternity. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, that's just a really neat thing to hold on to. Amen. So... Did, did God, after they sinned, go to plan B? Did he change his plan? Okay, Les says no. Joe? I agree. God never changes his plans. He's the same now forever. Mm-hmm. What I kind of got out of that was also was that as uh, he was coming upon them in, to the garden in the cool of the day, it was something that was normal. Mm -hmm. And they had, they had, they were happy. They were happy and they were glad to hear God's voice. But this time, they were ashamed. And when we do something wrong, we get ashamed. And they might not have known how to confess to God what was going on, you know, at the moment. Because evil was coming upon them, and they were confused. And, but God was there. God was there, and he knew their hearts. Amen. He, was he knows our hearts. So, anyways. Sally, looks like you. Uh, it, this goes back to before, so I'll not speed it up. But um, when Jesus died on the cross for everyone, he took the place of Adam. Mm -hmm. And we are no longer... As far as I understand, we are no longer slaves to sin anymore. We, are, we have been freed through the blood of Jesus Christ. And then, so when Satan tells us that we have to sin and keep on sinning, then he's lying to us. Mm -hmm. And we, as God's people, can rise above that we can cast satan out of our lives and christ being in us satan cannot make us sin so we have a choice to make mm -hmm. these are the times to make them 
because God is coming back. I want him to come back Amen. very much. And his people have to be ready. And God promises in the last days that his bride will be ready. We are the church. We are the bride. We need to put on Christ and cast Satan out. So let's come back. God comes to them. He shows initiative. He's reaching them. He has a heart of love. And so my next question would be, where else in the Bible do you see God showing initiative and going out trying to reach his children in love? Do you, let's we can have your comment. Yeah, I was just thinking there's a book out called uh, Witness of the Stars by Ballinger. And in that book, he shows how the stars are actually set up as a, um, not only a prediction, but a history of salvation. You can go through and see each aspect of salvation history in the stars. And I was just thinking, in order to do that, he would have had to have made them even before sin, so even before all this happened, the sky had the whole history of salvation in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was thinking about all the implications of that. Yeah, He's, he sees the big picture. He's working continually. So where, where else do you see God reaching, showing initiative, chasing after people in the Bible because of his love for them? Sheila. Just give me a few few instances here. Well, when he sent his only son okay. to come to this world. That, that's a very good one. Where, where else do you see God showing initiative on behalf of people? Karen. When he brought the Israelites out of Egypt. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. And then let's... I always think um, <clears throat> how... God can't keep starting all over, starting all over. You know, he started all over at Noah's time, and then he had to start all over again with Abraham. But he reached out to Abraham. He stepped into that because the knowledge of God had almost been completely lost. Mm -hmm. So he took an initiative, and he called out Abraham and told him to leave his kindred, leave his country, leave everything, so that he could preserve a knowledge of himself. So that was huge in my mind, that he would take that man out of his family and out of his country to preserve a knowledge, because it had been almost lost. Mm -hmm. So God's heart of love, he is reaching continue. Let's go to, to uh, Lynn, and then we'll come back to Liz, and she's close. It just made me think of um, Peter and Judas. It was very personal. Jesus knew Judas. He knew his heart. He knew his end from his beginning, but he still kept him close in, in hope. And, and then Peter. And to me, one of the most beautiful passages in Scripture is the three times he asked him, do you love me, to kind of counteract the three. And, um, you know, both of those... He pursued them. Mm -hmm. Amen. And Les. And then Joe. Well, thank you, Sister Lynn. <clears throat> Judas. No, Peter denied Jesus three times. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, Jesus asked Peter three times, Do you love me? He did that for a reason. But as I take a look at the Bible, it says the wages of sin is death. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Okay. We have the story way back in the beginning of Cain and Abel. Cain killed his brother. That was a sin. Am I right? Mm -hmm. He deserved to die right then and there. No questions asked. But God spared his life. God gave him another chance. Even when Cain said, Hey, 
I'm going to be a vagabond. And God came back and said, we'll put a mark on Cain. Nobody's going to kill him. God is very gracious to us sinners. Mm -hmm. I say us because he's very gracious to me. Amen. And Joe. And then we'll, we will move on. So just a picture of how God is chasing. He takes initiative. Joe. Um, I was just thinking, I know all these are really good. And there's so many more. There's so many more. Uh, but the one that touches my heart is the one where the thief was on the cross. You know, and how God told him that he would be in paradise. But then you also you think about uh, the, how he fed uh, the 5,000. And, and he was seeking towards people so many of them, and he's still doing the same thing today. Amen. So as you, you can just pan your mind as you read the Bible, and, and, and everywhere God is showing initiative. He is seeking. He is showing his love, trying to reach each one of those in the Bible, and that's, then we know that that is what he's doing for us too, that he loves each of you beyond our comprehension, and he is seeking to continually reach, he takes the initiative, he comes to start and help reinitiate that relationship. So let's, I'd like to transition a little and let's go now, jump to Genesis chapter 17. And I want to read verse 7, Genesis 17 verse 7. And here he's talking to Abram. Verse 7 says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. So God is longing to be with us. Right, let's, and that's, that's the theme. You can look through Isaac and Jacob, and the same is true. Um, if we jump to, to Moses, or, and same for Joseph, but let's go to Exodus chapter 3, verse 12. Exodus 3 and verse 12. And... Says So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. So he's sending Moses, and he continues, but God wants to be with us, and we're going to get in the New Testament what that looks like. And then we have the, the sanctuary that God set up in, in the wilderness, and what, what was the purpose of the sanctuary? that I may dwell among them. Yeah, God wanted to be with his people, and that whole, as you've looked, those of you who looked at the sanctuary, it just, it, it outlies or it puts together God's plan of redeeming and reaching mankind. So God wants to be with his people. Now, when you're in affliction or when you're in a challenging situation, can we know that God wants to be with you in that? In fact, God, God promised us, so we look in the Bible, you can maybe go back and think of Daniel in a lion's den, right? He's there, he's in a challenging situation, he's, he's there because he's standing for, for truth, but he finds himself in a challenging situation, but... God comes to be with him there. And so what other stories in the Bible? Where do you see God coming to be with someone in a trial when they're in the middle of a challenging situation? Barbara. The three worthies okay, in yeah. the fiery furnace. Yep, the three worthies right there where they get to have 
Jesus by their side less. We got three young grandchildren, and most of their favorite story hinges around David and Goliath. Okay. We even act out that song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anybody else? Any other stories? Yes. When you brought up the uh, subject of the sanctuary, and uh, this is included in, in other places in the Bible too, but this is strikingly clear. Uh, God not only wanted to be with us when he came down and had um, Moses put the sanctuary together, they had a physical manifestation that God was there with them. And uh, people who can talk about miracles in their lives, in their personal lives, have a physical manifestation of God being with them at that time. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Because you can, yeah, you can look through the Bible at apostles in prison. There's also where they're in affliction, they're in challenging, but God comes to be with them when they are standing for him. So let's, if someone could, let's see uh, who can read Read for me. Carol, would you be able to read John? Let's see. John 14, verse 23. John chapter 14, and verse 23. So just as she reads it, how, so how do the words of Jesus reinforce the idea that God wants to dwell with us? John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. So how, how, does, how does that happen? How does he come and make his home with you? He wants to be with you. How, how, does, how does that work? Dr. Carroll. The Holy Spirit is um, the comforter mm -hmm. that Jesus said he would send to the disciples. He sends it to us, and he fills us with his spirit when we ask for that, Amen. and we follow him and love him and keep his commandments. Amen. So he wants to come and make his home with us less. Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. That's what he wants. He says, my son, give me thy heart. Mm -hmm. The pen of inspiration says we can't give him our heart. It doesn't belong to us. Our heart's been sold to sin. How do I give something to somebody that I don't have? I have to ask him to change me, to come into my heart, to let my thoughts be his thoughts, and then I can give him my will. As I give him my will, he gives me the power, and now I've got the willpower. Mm -hmm. I can give him my heart now. Yeah. So we get this picture. Sin comes into the world. God takes initiative, he's chasing, he wants relationship, he's a God of love, and he promises that in affliction he's with you, whatever trial you're going through, he can be there, he wants to be there at your side to, to strengthen you, he, he doesn't promise to take us out of trial, he promises to be with us through trial. Carol. Well, this verse, it's interesting to read. Because it says, if any man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him. We. Does that mean he and the Father and the Holy Spirit? This is Jesus talking.
So in chapter, John chapter 1, in verses 1, 1 to 3, we're familiar, familiar with this, this, that mystery that John outlines to us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. So the, the incredible thing is that our Creator, the one who brought everything into being, is also our Redeemer. He is the one that is coming to restore us. And in Matthew, let's just jump back to the beginning of Matthew. We, you know, it gives us different names for Jesus. Matthew chapter 1 and verses, uh, let's see, eight, starting in 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. His mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, and then, you know, the found child by the Holy Spirit. And we come down, just going to jump to where, let's go to 23. It says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And before that, you know, it said his name shall be Jesus. So what, what is Jesus? What's, what, is, what does Jesus mean? Do you know what the meaning of the word Jesus? Savior. Yeah, Savior, the Lord saves. And we know Emmanuel is what? God with us. So the significance that Jesus is the one that saves. He's the creator. He's also our redeemer. He wants to be with us. He wants a relationship, and he is the one that can pave the way to restore us. And so, when Jesus came as this child, and he grew up, and as you know, he, he dies on the cross. He, he lives a sinless life that we can be redeemed, that his life can cover our life. What, what risk did he take by coming to do that? Was there, was there a risk in him coming to earth as a baby and living and dying? What, what was his risk? Zach is ready to take. Okay, Les. What, what was the risk when he chose to become one with humanity? In my opinion, brother, the biggest risk was that he could sin. Okay. He was fully man. He was fully God. Now, God can't sin, but the human part of Jesus could have sinned. There were a lot of risks, very serious risks. He could have been killed when he was a baby. But I think above it all was the risk that he could sin. We could, it could all have been lost. The whole plan of salvation could have been flushed. So wh why, why would you take a risk for someone you, your child, or someone in your family? Would you, would you take a risk on their behalf? And why would you do that? Because of love, right? Because you love. And that, that's the risk because God's love. And we, we can't even begin to fathom the love that he has for each of us. Let's expand on that thought for just a second. John 3.16, God so loved the world. That's something we will, I don't think I'll ever comprehend. That he gave, Lynn. You know, in that uh, section, Mary and Joseph, we see just kind of an example for us of relationship with him. He was faithful to them both and he was, he understood Joseph's reaction to the situation. And just at the time that Joseph needed it, you know, the angel came to him that the, wasn't it a dream? 
um, and kind of lined it out for him so he'd understand what was happening. And in our relationship with him, we need that same heart to trust him in his timing to let us know the things that are happening and to not get worked up and not, you know, come apart, but just trust him and keep our focus on him. Joseph had to have had a focus on him for him to have such a kind heart toward Mary. You know, he was devising a plan, but it was a plan of kindness. And so, you know, he had to have had a walk with God, you know, to come up with that. And then God stepped in. And it's just, to me, it's just an example of relationship with God and how trustworthy he, he is and how we need, you know, to take charge of ourselves, essentially, and mm -hmm. just exhale and allow him to take us on the journey. Amen. So if you just step back again, look at the big picture. We, Adam and Eve sin. God comes to them. He takes initiative. Sorry. He's, <laughs> he's chasing after them out of his love. You know, it says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's the love of God chasing after, after you. And so God's he wants to have be with us. He came to all the different uh, patriarchs wanting relationship with them. We know that he came as a child to die that because of his love that he can come and have a relationship with you and me. As Carol shared, you know, in John 14, you know, it says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, he will give you another helper. And at the end it says, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. He wants to come to us. And he's not only wanting to come to us now and restore us, but he's coming back again. And he's coming back again very soon. And our part in that big picture of God's love, his showing initiative, what, what is our part? Where do you and I fit in? What, what is our role? Cooperate. Yeah, and how do you cooperate? Surrender. Is surrendering yourself. Yeah, not, not my will, but thy will. Realizing, okay, I can't do this. I've got nothing in my own strength and wisdom. I am totally dependent upon him. And he's after relationship. We say, you know, he stands at the door and knocks. If anyone opens the door, he's going to come in and sup with us. And he wants, he wants that relationship. He wants to come in. And you and I have the opportunity, not just once in a lifetime, but moment by moment, to say, yes, I want that. Is that always easy? No. No, we, we have an adversary, but God promises in trial, we can see so many instances of that in the Bible, that when you're in trial, God comes to be and sustains and strengthens through that trial. We have to accept it. Yeah, we have to accept it. So God is faithful. His love is beyond our comprehension. And he is coming back soon. He wants to be with us. And I just, our time is gone. Now let's close with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, we are going to be throughout eternity coming to an understanding of your incredible love, of your goodness, of your mercy, of your compassion. And Father, we, we realize we are totally undeserving. We've got nothing good in ourselves, and we owe everything to you. And this morning, we want our lives to be that thank you, and, and we can only do that as, as we submit ourselves, as we invite you in day by day, moment by moment, submitting reading your word, inviting you in that we can have that relationship that you are so eager to have with us. And we just want to have your heart in us because when we have your heart in us, we will take up your mission and your focus and that we will carry, be your feet and your hands and your eyes to carry out and fulfill your mission. And Father, we believe with all our hearts you're coming back soon. And we want to be a part of that. And so we invite you into our lives this morning. And we just commit ourselves once more to you. In Jesus' name, amen.